Hey, before I kick off the podcast, I just want to shout out Nextdoor Clothing. Nextdoor, uh, a clothing brand based out of Bondi in Sydney. They're making really nice jeans and shirts and hats. So go and check out their full range at nextdoorsydney.com. They're also artists, so you can go and check out a range of art. They put on rad parties, and I love what they're doing. So nextdoorsydney.com for the full range. This week I speak with Doctor of Sociology, Vietnamese war orphan, skateboarder and co-author of the book Skateboarding Power and Change, it's Dr. Indigo Willing. Wow, she's just such a rad human, I don't even know where to start with Dr. Indigo. She takes us on a journey through her life so far, from her early days post-Vietnam War, being adopted by an Australian family and relocated to the northern suburbs of Sydney. And then she talks about her experiences growing up in this uh, culture and she does highlight the racism that she experienced for, for much of her life. Dr. Indigo just loves skateboarding. It's so nice. I mean, I love it too, but what I found funny throughout the interview was she puts everything in a skate context and all her examples are skate related, just complete, uh, completely in love with the activity that I love as well. She um, has done extensive work with communities. She has also been an advisor to the awesome non-government organisation Skaterstan and she was the recipient of an Order of Australia medal which she resigned from for ethical reasons and she goes into that story but it's a great chat. We met up, had a little skate beforehand, got a coffee, then recorded on her adoptive father's boat, which was a new experience for me. But the acoustics were great. We recorded in the cabin. And uh, ultimately, I think Dr. Indigo is an advocate for themes of inclusivity, kindness, empathy. And she really epitomizes it with her general nature and approach to everyone that she meets. And I really believe that is the key to her success in in, uh, making change. And she is very much a change maker. Uh, Darren Caney sits in this week as guest co-host. And uh, that's always fun, getting Dags' perspective. As always, this episode is for my children, Clementine and Otis. So enjoy. spend a lot of time working with people from very different backgrounds uh, because that's skateboarding. It just reflects the world that we live in. So if you're at the skate park these days, as opposed to the past, uh, there'll be people with refugee backgrounds, there'll be people that are mums, there'll be, you know, somebody that has um, survived cancer and, you know, took up skating as a way to get back into exercising. There'll just be such a great bunch of life experiences and skateboarding brings us all together in this unique space to talk and bond and pretty soon you're like, you know, making connections with people that are very different to you. But at the same time, you've got this common love of skateboarding that will bring you together. So it's really cool. But don't you think that's applicable to any activity though? It's not just skateboarding. So skateboarding is unique in some ways, uh, particularly because we do a lot of it on the street and we sort of use the public space in a way that isn't common to most people. And with most sports, you turn up to a sports field, you've got times where you're scheduled to skate, you have a uniform, you probably have a coach and a referee telling you what to do. Mm. You've got maybe time in the locker room to socialise and then everybody goes home. Whereas skateboarding is much more social. So you will firstly have to skate to and from the spot on your, um, I guess, you know, what we do is more than a sport, but 
essentially the equipment that we use, we take through the streets with ordinary people that don't share what we do. Mm. Uh, then we look kind of unique in that space and we see the architecture very, very differently. So if we're looking at a bench, you know, we're looking at somewhere to, you know, we're looking at an obstacle. Um, if we do a skate trick, it's not just in front of other skaters, but it could actually be some parents that are shopping with their kids. It could be some angry, you know, Karen <laughs> that's just really annoyed with us. could be often it is around people that are homeless and people with addiction problems, uh, sex workers. Um, it's you know, a whole bunch of people from different worlds that we all get along with or we have to get along with. And it opens our minds, I think. It, it makes us very open-minded and adaptive. So with that in mind, when we go to the skate park, we bring all those experiences with us. We bring that life experience and that way of navigating the social world into that skate park area as well. So I think that we're more than just people that go to a football field or, you know, more than people that go to a um, you know, swimming pool and do our stuff. We, we bring a lot of life experiences with us in what we do and that's shared pretty easily. Mm. Darren, Darren connected us. Thanks, Dags, by the way. No and um, would you, is Darren someone you would hang out with otherwise if you didn't skate? Be honest. Be, be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe I should say how I met Darren. That would make more sense. Um, I was actually looking for people to skate with my age because I'm, I'm turning 52 this you know, next month, so this year. And um, I started skating when I was 41 and... You know, a lot of people when they learn younger, you know, they totally rip and it's very easy for them to, you know, uh, go to a skate park and feel comfortable. But because I learned when I was older, I just asked a mate, hey, can you introduce me to some, you know, people that are older and skate? And he introduced me to Darren over Instagram and I thought, you know, he seems cool. But I didn't know he was a former or, you know, he is a pro skater and he's, on, you know, like uh, flow for like, you know, America and all these other things. And he, he's just a very you know, beautiful skater to watch. Uh, so that was interesting because it's like, oh, great. <laughs> you know, now I'm going to skate in this chill session with somebody that's... So you thought you were going to hang out with some <laughs> dude with a dad bod with yeah. knee, knee pads and a helmet? Yeah, I was looking for the chill bowl session, like maybe, you know, a little chicken scratch and a bowl, <laughs> just well, chilling. Well, how did you know Dave in the first place? Because Yeah, yeah. Dave's rips too, actually. The guy that introduced us, he's a street skater from um, San Diego. He's a real OG and he's um, connected to me through being adopted from Vietnam. So... Um, you have a lot of similarities with people, right, when you have these unique experiences. So not just skateboarding, but I, I, I met this guy, Dave Frey, and shout out to him um, through being adopted from Vietnam during the Vietnam War and being raised by non-Vietnamese people, so real cross-cultural uh, experience. And it just happened that I think I saw a photo of Dave actually doing a frontside grind in this really gnarly bowl. And he's not a bowl skater, but, you know, he's, he's just naturally talented at skating and just gives it his all. And, um, yeah, we, we just were, I don't know, um, talking about skating. He knew I was really into it and he just appreciated, you know, how old I was when I started. And yeah, with the, the age thing, I said, oh yeah, like, you know, can I meet some older skaters? And I think he tagged me and, uh, Darren also, cause, um, Darren skates Mona Vale and maybe I had some clips at Mona Vale cause, you know, I grew up here when I was younger and yeah, this is how we met Darren and would I hang out with him if I didn't skate? <laughs> I hope so. He's a cool person and I just love meeting Thank people you. from all backgrounds. And um, He's, he's also a rare gem <laughs> in terms of skateboarding. He's not your stereotypical 47-year-old. and that, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we talked about this in the coffee shop when we, we were waiting, waiting an extended period of time for our coffees this morning. Yeah. Uh, it can be disheartening when you hang out with really good skaters. <laughs> yeah. Even for myself, like when I skate with Darren sometimes, like, what comes easy to him, I have to work for. Even this morning when you said, hey, I want to get a clip of you and Darren doing a trick on the manual pad. <laughs> and he kick flip manual the whole thing, first shot, Darren. But that's not intimidating, is it? It's I was like intimidating. It's inspiring. I, I was, um, more than anything, right? No, but I yeah, think, no, I it's not, I'm not saying, I didn't use the word intimidating, I said disheartening. Okay. Where I feel like it can be like a bit, ah. Oh. Now, as someone that started, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But as yeah. someone that started in their early 40s, which would be considered quite late, yeah. uh, have you felt those experiences and how have you managed them? Oh, true. So firstly, um, like this morning, I think you, you know, you did an ollie kickflip and it looked like no effort for you, Shan. So, you know, for, for somebody like me, it's like, you know, it's it's really... I wasn't happy with it, I won't lie. And and then you weren't even happy with it. You wanted to put some more stees in it, but it was, it was really good and relaxed kind of morning session. And I hadn't given you much time to warm up and I wanted to 
film both Darren and you doing some tricks holding the book for something fun. I'd seen uh, Walker Ryan do a book promo of his book, you know, and I think he did a, you know, a, um, the Nolly, a Nose Manny flip out or something and, you know, a lot of stees. And so I thought it'd just be fun to film some tricks and, you know, it was really good getting, you know, like just casually I sort of asked you out of the blue and you did it, you, Shan, did a front board uh, Nolly flip, you know, with a, you know, sort of added, um, sort of, you know, backside 180 just to add a little bit more spice to the ending or the beginning. And, um, yeah, yeah. And I, I, you know, I just feel like, um, it's inspiring to me. I'm glad that Darren used that word. It's, it can be intimidating being in the park in that environment, but seeing other people skate well and just skating because they love it. And you can tell that they, are in their zone and it's giving them a lot of joy. That's that's really good. That's, I love seeing people having fun and just being themselves and that's why I think I'd probably hang out with Darren and, and you if you, we didn't skate and I feel we just met some other way. We're very sort of, you know, passionate people that love taking, you know, new experiences and pushing ourselves and just having a lot of fun and not doing it for money, not doing it for fame. Like I, I wish that we were rich and famous <laughs> sitting here, you know, with... um you know, like uh, a lot more sort of, you know, uh, money for the types of things like a podcast and, you know, I just read a book and, you know, Darren does heaps of stuff too. And, you know, skateboarding doesn't normally come with a lot of money, right? We we do not do this for money. We do it for love. So uh, skating is like that. So You're not comparing yourself to others at the skate park. <laughs> when when I'm at the skate park now for as a mum as well, like um, I do feel sometimes a bit weird because I like street skating a lot. And I, I, I take this from Kristen the Belling from Skate Like a Girl. She, she rips and she said that she was raised by wolves when she learned to skate because she skated around the dudes. And yeah. um, that's my story as well. Like I, I learned to skate at Paddo Skate Park in Brisbane. Love old Paddo. A lot of affection for it. Uh, but I was probably, there were only like two girls there when I started skating. And typically it'd be like a lot of dudes, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of beer and, uh, the way that the layout, the design wasn't really friendly for newcomers and beginners per se. It was like kind of a corner where everyone sat. And um, yeah, you know, you had to have a lot of guts to get in there. That's hilarious. I just bumped the sound. <laughs> that, was, that was that was. But skateboarding's never been cool. about the level that you're at and the tricks that you're doing and how experienced you are. It's 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 for everyone, right? And it's and the person yeah. that's ripping the most at the skate park is not necessarily doing the hardest tricks, right? It's true. And I also think the person having the most fun is—is is that the person having? Yeah. Like, is that the person who's having the best skate at the skate park? It, it proves itself time and time again. And if you see some person come to the skate park learning to drop in for the first time, everyone is stoked for them, right? Mm. You see them struggling, you think, thinking, "No way, this is such an unusual thing to do." Like, there's nothing else that compares to skateboarding with what you do with your body. Like, you can take a Olympian that can run a hundred meters in under ten. Uh, you can take a gymnast who can do this amazing stuff, but ask them to start ollieing or kick flipping or dropping in. It's a foreign experience for the body. There's no precedence for us to be doing this on wheels. So, yeah, every time you watch somebody drop in for the first time or you watch a video clip on Instagram and somebody's got their kick flip for the first time, it's just so joyful, right? It's, it is. It's about the fun and the joy. It's not that that's the best trick in the world or that's executed in the most best way. It's literally everybody knows that moment of, challenging yourself and rolling away and just thinking, yes, you know, like, you know, go me. <laughs> yeah. We spoke on the phone the other day and you mentioned that skate parks can be an intimidating place hmm. for some people, whether they're new, maybe it could be a, a gender-based intimidation. Do you really feel that way? Because I thought about it after the phone call hmm. and I feel that skate parks are way less intimidating than they used to be. In fact, the hmm. opposite. I don't see kids intimidated at skate parks. Yeah, yeah. So it depends. Everything's context, right? So I've been to 10 cities around Australia. I've been to Broome, Bendigo, Townsville, Ipswich, Toowoomba, Brisbane, here. And each, seriously, each park will have a different vibe. The more regional you get, the kinder people are because they all skate together. You know, there's, there's not as much um, cool going at the regional parks between the kids that BMX, the kids that scooter and the kids that ride a skateboard, often they'll share it because those people don't have, you know, firstly they've got to see each other the next day. So, like, if you vibe somebody out, you don't have ten parks to choose. And 
they're, they're real people people, right? They're real friendly. And I was, I was saying that to you when we got to the park, like, because I'm from Brisbane, I say hi to everybody I see in Sydney and feel like Crocodile Dundee when he's walking down New York saying, g'day, g'day, and everyone's like, what, what are you on? Or are you trying to sell me something? Or Like that real friendly, and Brisbane's a bit like that too. It's a big country town. So I feel the skate parks are real friendly and you can be skating beside Dennis Durant or Alex Lawton or like, you know, guys that really rip from, um, you know, Chloe Cavell skates up in the Gold Coast a lot, Arissa True, like they're winning X Games, but mm. everyone's on the level. Everyone treats each other equal and says hi. And, um, you know, if somebody falls over, like you literally rely on each other as a community to call the AMBO or whatever and, you know, you can't you can't sort of vibe somebody out and then rely on them to go call an ambulance when you might have fallen over and slammed and you're like, you know, need the green whistle or whatever, right? So I feel like... Skate parks are a sense of community. They're much more friendly now. I know in the past uh, is more territorial. And like I said, I, I skated, I learned to skate at Pado and it wasn't this like, you know, uh, everybody skates welcoming vibe back then. You, you had to kind of skate there for three months before someone would say hi to you. And, you know, there's a reason for that, right? I, I totally understand it. It's like what we do is really hard and it's a time out place for places where you're not accepted anywhere else. So you go to skate park in the past, that would be somewhere where you could be like, you know, just yourself and you might be a bit wild and you might like have had a, a job where you have to behave all day and it's killing your soul and you just want to have fun and just be your wild self. So in some ways I don't like skate parks being sanitised. I think, you know, they should be places where you can be an outsider and a misfit and just hang out, like young people hang out and do their stuff and have fun. Um, but on the other hand, like, you know, We've all got to coexist, so in coexisting, that also means, you know, welcoming the people that are a bit awkward, welcoming the people that, you know, um, are new to the park and might not know the etiquette and know how to use it. So mm. we're at that stage where, yeah, it's definitely a different vibe at a lot of the city skate parks. And it just, you know, it just depends what scene you go into and generally you'll find somebody that's real cool and just welcomes you. Yeah, it's true. I actually want to ask this question to Darren. Like, I was thinking about it the other day, man, like, I feel like skateboarding has turned out to be what I dreamed of as a kid. Do you know what I mean? And and I want to see if you feel the same. When I was a kid, we were outcasts for skateboarding. No one liked us. We had nowhere to skate. And we used to yeah. dream of things and we talk about things like imagine there were skate parks everywhere and imagine skating was in the Olympics and imagine we were it was socially acceptable. We used to talk about that. What do you think? Well, I think um – there's more skate parks these days because of that fact, for sure. But I remember when we were kids, it was just like we'd have to be in the streets because that's all we could skate. The skate parks were basically, what, vert ramps, transitions. If you don't want to skate that, you have yeah. to go in the streets. And now the skate parks are basically emulating what's in the street. streets. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's completely changed. Are you, are you happy with how it's turned out from when you're a young person? Um, I mean... The mainstream factor, because there is a mainstream factor to it now. How does it make you feel? There's, it's just the skate parks are busier these days. I don't like busy skate parks. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. Like, <laughs> uh, that's the selfish part of me talking now. But um, I get it though. Uh, yeah, well, and skateboarding was more. It was very a subculture. You know, back in the day. Now it's a, a sport. You know, it's a, it's a legitimate activity that, that that you know your parents are bringing your kids down there, and we going to go to the olympics i'm going to get a you know it's it's a it's a recognized uh activity he says and it just wasn't before it was a, it was a sub culture you know it was it was frowned upon did you like being an outcast uh personally yeah i did yeah yeah, yeah. what about you why i did to an extent until it wasn't until something not nice happened like you know people used to scream at you from their cars that was such a common thing like yeah. Skaters suck or do a kickflip. I mean, people still might do that. <laughs> but or I mean, we used to get things like skaters are gay, like from cars. And maybe this is just a narrow thing, but <laughs> yeah, you know, no, that's when I right. didn't like it. Yeah, well, people just didn't understand it. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they see someone else doing the thing, creative, creatively, having fun, and people are just envious of that. I, I think you know, like some people are just like, why are these people out here doing what they want to do, having fun, mm. and I'm stuck here like. Whatever is going on, I've got a crappy job or I've got a crappy life or I've got, you know, problems, drug habits or what, whatever it might, might be, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah, you've got to take out some 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 anger on on uh, skateboarders yeah. or the, the subcultures. <laughs> what do you think, Indigo? Minorities. Yeah. Mm. 
Oh, um, people have been yelling at me from cars for a long time, whether it's skate or not. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Why? interesting. I, I, I grew up here on the northern beaches, and I don't think people were necessarily uh, anti-Asian, but I, I, like just, just you know, you get some people that are drunk too much, and they're in the car, they see a girl, like you know, like just yell out at her, and whatever it is, like you know, if you're black or maybe Asian or you know, maybe your body wasn't like perfect or something, like men just Yelling stuff is a bit of having a bit of fun for them in the past. And I would have like people be racist to me every day and like yell out from their cars, you know, like um, Asian invasion or, you know, uh, boat person or was it fresh off the boat? That's what it was. And like people threw rocks at me and my auntie lived at Narrabeen and she lived next to like a place that had a, was full of skinheads. So I'd have to walk past there all the time and, you know, they would say, oh, you know, like, um, you know, you dirty boat person and stuff, like, because I was from Vietnamese, but I don't think they even cared. Like, if it wasn't Vietnamese, I'd be called, you know, Japanese or Chinese. And I think it's just getting stuff off their chest because, you know, like, life's hard, right? And you're an outcast and you just try and – it's a bit like Animal Farm. Like, you've got a bit of power. You just use it because you, you're just laying off steam. And it was um, – I reckon a lot of those people now would be eating Vietnamese food and probably going to Bali for their holidays. Like, they just didn't have the opportunity to – stop the car, get out of the car and meet me, you know. <laughs> like, you don't even know me, man. Like just mm. just keep yelling from your car. But like one day you're going to have a spring roll and you're going to think, oh, my God, Asians are like awesome. <laughs> you are going to go to like Bali and like see the surf and think, oh, it's so much better, like just hanging out here and like, you know, you're going to watch some martial arts film and think those guys aren't weak and just do math. They're like hard ass. Like, you know, it's just opportunity, isn't it, right? So... Yeah, that whole yelling from cars, same with skaters. Like I think people are just getting used to seeing skaters on TV. We've had the Olympics. Yeah, it's a bit of a, you know, a change, but skateboarding is what you want it to be, okay? So it's like it can be subcultural and I think, you know, like talking about, you know, young skaters are gay, like or you know, whatever, skating's gay. Like literally there are gay skaters, there are queer skaters and they're like really punk. Like they're, they haven't had all the sponsorship, they haven't had the X Games, they haven't been on teams, they've created their own subcultural scene that's really rad right and so you know I think um yeah like it's always got an out it's always going to have an outsider aspect and at the moment interestingly it's the girls and women scene and the queer scene that is really pushing what's wild like you know making like clips without any money doing it themselves building their own companies just saying you know uh, F you to the mainstream and to you know soft drink companies trying to sell out skateboarding and doing it on their own so I feel like, yeah, you know, it's just um, it's going to have that subcultural element at the same time. The Olympics gives a lot of opportunities to skaters to get paid for what they do. You know, from like 15 to 25, there's a lot of toll on their bodies to do what they do. If they can make a bit of money, getting a bit of exposure, getting a nutritionist, getting physiotherapy, getting insurance, like, you know, like we know so many pro skaters. Who are we talking about for? Brandon Turner? Mm. You know, like Sean Malto, like there's so many good skaters that you can, like, you, know, you can list hundreds that have injured themselves. And I just like a world where they get paid a bit of compo until they can skate again, get some rehab, like physical rehab, get physio, and then get back to skating. And if they can't skate, I'd still love them to have jobs where they can be close to skateboarding as coaches, as like referees. Like they had some non skaters compare the women's skateboarding competition it was just so bad right why not pay skaters to do that like you know have a chat so yeah I'm I'm kind of all for skateboarding going in any directions it can to support mm. skaters you meant like you mentioned you experienced racism because that was actually one of my questions mm. how would you describe your experiences with sexism oh my god I wasn't expecting that question, hey. Uh, do you know what? Sometimes I forget that I'm a woman, which sounds really bad. But, like, I think maybe skating is at that point where we can skate this morning and you're like, oh, you're good for a girl, and you go, or you can't do that because you're Did I say that girl. at some stage? No, no, no. I'm saying we're at that point where we're past sexism, I feel. Like, you're just, you know, you're probably just what about, skating. What about in general life, though? Um, yeah, so I'm not going to say sexism doesn't exist. Like, it's only two years ago... <laughs> boats, we're on a boat, it's moving a lot. This is so cool. And um, so, yeah, it was only about three years ago that Kim Woozy from Skate Like a Girl organisation in the US, which is the biggest sort of skate org for, you know, getting girls and women and non-binary people to skate, 
many non-binary, we can explain what that is later, but that's just people on the gender spectrum that um, have some diversity. And she went to the US, I think it was like the court for some legislation to get equal pay for skating in competitions. And it was called the Equal Pay for Equal Play Bill. And what that means is if you hold a skate competition on government land, you have to have equal prize money. And there's been a bit of controversy over that. Like people are like, well, you know, like the guys do, you know, uh, technically they do different tricks at a different level. But like nobody gives, a, you know, nobody cares about that when you book a plane ticket to the comp. When you want to book a hotel to stay for your team, nobody cares what gender you are. The price is the same. It's not like we get a women's discount for flying, driving, petrol costs. Uh, if you injure yourself, same thing. Like if you can't go to work for three days to six weeks because you busted your rib or whatever it is, or, you know, ACL surgery, like it doesn't matter what gender you are. You're going to pay for that, right? So if you want to have competition and you want to allow that, then equal pay. Like if you don't want women there, just say it. Like literally, you know, we don't want women there because the expenses are the same. And we've just had the Women's World Cup in soccer. And, you know, there's like 60, 70,000 people turned up in Sydney to watch that game. I think it actually made probably millions in um, viewers and profits. So it's not like women's sport isn't profitable either. So It was this, the most watched yeah. TV show in the last 50 years or something ridiculous, wasn't it? Like the, yeah. it beat out like... The neighbors, like final episode, <laughs> or the NRL yeah. grand final, or Take whatever that, it was. You know, like, <laughs> carry yeah. the girls, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So people are saying people are interested in watching women's sport, like same with Venus and Serena Williams in tennis. Like I, I, I don't watch that much sport, but these these women's sport sells tickets. So it's not the commercial side; it's not the cost of that. And if you watch like uh, Arissa True, she just did a seven twenty at a competition from the Tony Hawk who he didn't get that trick till in his 20s or 30s, right? We've got like a 13-year-old girl landing that and winning gold at the X Games. So the little 13-year-old girls who are given all the opportunity in the world to get as much training and time and encouragement to skate, push themselves to skate, you know, any way they want, they're, they're really ripping, right? So if we look at Chloe Cavell, we look at Arissa True, Hayley Powell, there's a whole bunch of uh, Brazilian and Japanese skaters as well. Like it's mind-blowing what they're achieving and to say, okay, well, you're only still going to get half the money of the boys so you can't afford to go to all the qualifiers. You can only go to seven comps where the boys can afford to go to 14 comps because they've got the airfare money from the prize money. I just don't think that's that makes sense to me. It's not fair. Can I ask you a question about Letitia Buffoni? Yeah, sure. How do you feel about the identity she chooses to portray. Oh, look, I'm I'm a big fan of Letitia, to be honest. Like, so power to her. Like, she's she's got a reputation of being really kind and really supportive of all the skaters. She put Chloe Cavell, I think, on her board team when she started. She's um, Brazilian. Like, they're tough as nails. Like, you know, I think uh, we should never underestimate any skaters from Brazil and what they achieve. And you know, like, I, I don't want to watch all the time skaters, um, you know, with like the commercial side of thing doesn't appeal to me, but I totally understand it. So if you want a soft drink sponsorship or, you know, you get sports cars to ask you to pose in a bikini in their, you know, front of their car, like go for it. I think, you know, time is um, valuable and, you know, you've got to pay your bills and you've also got every right to, you know, be out there and be a woman and be sexy. I think that's cool, actually. I think, you know. If um, the men take a good look at themselves at the skate park, they're shirtless half the time. They wear less clothes than the girls. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for, like, her modelling as well. I mm. think, like, you know, there's no reason to hate on that unless you're an insecure person, to be honest. Yes. Okay. It's what, great to get... What sorry. do you feel about her, her image that you're trying to ask the question? Do you think she's sort of a more feminine or sexualized? Well, yeah, my, than... my question is, do you think the image that she portrays mm. is productive to the progression of female skateboarding because she, I guess, dresses and represents herself in a way that is a little bit more sexualized mm. uh, traditionally and it's very feminine but what is feminine these days? <laughs> and and I'm, I'm just like... Yeah, I'm 100% is, is it, for it. Is yeah. it productive to yeah. the... To the progression of the f the sport for females, that's that, yeah. I guess the question I want to know. Yeah, or totally. is it is it taking them a step back in like, hey, you're not going to get sponsorship deals unless you get your tits out. 
No, no, I'm totally all for a big variety of people expressing themselves true to themselves because I, I don't think she's forcing herself in a bikini to, to make money. I think that, you know, in Brazil, like if you've ever been part of their culture, it's like, you know, I think it's even where twerking or maybe that's from mm. the Caribbean, but like the Brazilians wear bikinis, like, you know, we would wear shorts and jeans. Like it's just pretty natural over there. I think it's us that has the problem mm. sexualizing skaters that want to, you know, skate in swimwear if they want or whatever it is. And she's, she's very attractive. Like, you know, I feel like if somebody is great at playing Beethoven or if somebody is great at brain surgery, like why not just let them, you know, <laughs> enjoy their natural talents mm. in a sense. So I reckon, and, and it's, it's counterpointed by if you only let Letitia Bulfoni types into your skate teams or if you only let really photogenic women that, you know, might wear swimwear into your skate mags, then it's a problem. And that's changing now. Like okay. you literally got like Brianna Gearing on um, Real. We've got, uh, you know, um, down in Melbourne, there's a skateboarder. Um, she was on Slam in the cover. You know, there's a lot of queer women basically that are on the covers of magazines now. They're not like trying to be sexualized for like men. You could, you know, argue that all day and not mm. get very far. And yet, you know, I, I just feel like the men just aren't judged as hard for being shirtless in a film clip or... Mm you know, looking nice. So I think that if as long as it's put in its context and everyone's allowed to skate in their authentic selves, then it works well. So I'd never like, want to, cool. like, you know, change yeah. anybody from being their authentic selves, I guess. That's okay. Cool. Mm. And, you know, I was just thinking, it's funny how uncomfortable I felt bringing that up, but I wanted to bring it up and I, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I feel uncomfortable because <laughs> I'm scared of saying the wrong thing and offending yeah. people. And I guess with, I guess the current climate of our society, do you think like lack of education in regards to sexual identity issues or uh, gender identity issues is perpetuating more disease amongst communities? Do you you mean lack of education because people have been dickheads to like people that are different to them? Yeah, I guess. (laughs) I I feel like... I guess... do you think there's an underlying – there is an underlying desire to oppress from people or is it just sheer ignorance and ad, ed, lack oh, of education? Yeah, I'm with you now. With you Sorry, you. I didn't – I knew what I wanted to say but it was quite a hard no, thing I'm trying a, to get to. I hope you're following me. Thank yeah, you. I'm following you now and um, I was before. I was just trying to narrow down. It's such a good question and a great topic and it's a loaded topic, right? Like we don't get to sit and chat about this much at I, the skate park. I, I, I genuinely <laughs> – don't want to put anyone down, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I I do it sometimes indirectly. Yeah. I'll admit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The skateboarding industry has a history of of yeah. singling out certain uh, humans in a way, like you know, like uh, gay men in the past have been very discriminated against in skateboarding, and mm-hmm. it's only just recently yeah. that they've actually. Is that yeah. sort of? Do you uh, think Brian Anderson was the breakthrough for the skateboarding in regards to that? Yeah. That, it's a, break, it's a breakthrough for you yeah. guys, right? Like Brian Anderson, I, I was so lucky to start skating in 2014, so about 10 years ago, nine or 10 years ago, and Brian Anderson had just come out in um, 2016. And but it was common knowledge that he was gay yeah, for yeah. many, many years before he actually publicly... Yeah, it was the first sort of, it wasn't the first, but it was one of the most prominent uh, examples of a man to come out as gay. But in skating, like... You know, literally, unless you've not been paying attention, like 90% of women skaters are queer. So it's not like with the women skating that they weren't used to gay, like lesbians and, you know, um, queer women skating. So this whole thing about, you know, all of a sudden being, you know, surprised that people aren't heterosexual in skating is a bit weird considering that most guys I speak to when I ask them, like, do you know any sort of um, women that are lesbians that skate. And they're like, yeah, of course they do. So Did you say 90%? Is that a No, actual, no, no. You just, <laughs> no, I, was just that I was just like <laughs> just tossing it, it around. Because it is. It's a large percentage for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's like you, 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 I'm sure you've all grown up skating with like, you know, queer women. So I think it was more like this manhood and like just having a, you know, really homophobic kind of insecure sort of um, thing in the industry, thinking that if somebody came on as gay, they won't sell boards or the average 15 year old won't understand it. And like, we've come a long way from the eighties where there were lots of gay jokes and homophobia and transphobia in our movies, right? I've, I've, I've watched so many films now as an adult 
and looked back at them and thought, why did we think that was funny? That's so cringe, right? And, you know, there's like date rape jokes. There's just so much going on in the 80s that was meant to be funny and humorous back then. And it wasn't even like mean spirited. It was literally like, like Animal Farm, like whoever has the power at the time, you know, dictates the jokes and they don't always understand, you know, the, the impact that that has that, it, you know, can be really damaging to people's self-esteem and can make people be inauthentic and hide themselves in closets and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I guess are we taking ourselves too serious, you think? That's yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, I reckon what's real important now is that um, skating's going to have a lot of people from different genders and different sexualities that are going to be open about it, but they've always been there. And literally, like, if you look back in Greek society, um, you know, there's a lot of homosexuality. It's not a new thing, right? We're talking about, like, Socrates and Plato, like, from the beginning of Western civilization, as, it, you know, it's known there's always been gay people. If we go to the Pacific and we look at Thailand... Like, you know, Asia, um, India, you know, there's always been people that have uh, been in between genders or transgender in Samoa, for instance, uh, into Tiwi Islands. And, you know, you can't tell me that, that, that it's woke, that they're that way or that it's trendy. Like, this goes back from the time of their culture. And so we're just understanding, I think, now that there is this gender diversity and that we haven't had names for it before in Western society and that the la names that we have in the labels have been made up and pretty derogatory some of the time, right? And we just want to get rid of that and just let people chill and be themselves is yeah. my understanding in skating. And like I said, if, if they're on the margins at the moment, that will change one day now, like because everybody is being more accepting or just not making a big deal about it, we all just can skate now. You know, I don't want to like go to the skate park and worry about, um, you know, like you said, getting in trouble. So I think the more that we have these sort of conversations, like you say, educate each other on how we want to be talked about, then we can just get over it and skate together and, you know, everything is, um, you know, going to be connecting us. Like, you know, we're all so different in this room and we all skate and, I, you know, I think like, you know, there's nothing about skateboarding that doesn't stop people from connecting across their differences. If anything, it really helps us yes. do that. Yes. Listen, for those that aren't aware, uh, can you describe to us like you're a doctor of sociology? Correct? Yeah, I'm not a medical doctor. They make money and they're useful. <laughs> I just <laughs> study philosophy. Is it philosophy or sociology? Is so, it? sociology um, is a yeah, branch yeah, of so philosophy, yeah. For, for, we'll break it down. What, is, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, and and I what, what, what's the content of, of that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So there's quite a lot of skaters with um, PhDs, so that's short for Doctor of Philosophy. And um, from that there's various disciplines and mine's sociology, which is... Kind of the study of society, Darren. Like I got confused too when I started, and people ask, "What? What do you actually? What does a, what does a sociologist do?" I'm like, "I don't know, man." But a good example is that <laughs> is it a study you, about humans interact with one yeah, another? Yeah, yeah. It's a, a study of society, it's a so the socials. Yeah. And um, you know, as an example, I always say, "Not." It sounds really radical on your show, maybe Shan, but like Dr. Martin Luther King had a Bachelor of Arts in sociology, mm -hmm. really interested in justice and social rights, but. From a really real point of view, like life and death, not like sitting around a cafe worried about, you know, if someone's using the right terminology. It's like literally uh, just making sure people are safe to get jobs and people are safe to walk down the street where they're getting yelled at. Um, and, yeah, there's a lot of people that uh, study architecture that have a PhD. So Ocean Howell, he's like a former pro skater. Power to him, he's got a PhD and he um, writes skate studies uh, Ian Bourdain wrote Skate in the City. If anyone wants to get into reading about skateboarding and people that have studied it, um, there's some really great, uh, I think I showcase about 30, at least 30 skaters that have gone on to do studies that skateboard and look at the city and how to make uh, cities more understanding of skaters' needs and getting rid of those silly skate stoppers and, you know, building skate parks that are designed better so that, you know, everyone feels like it's being used um, in a good way, so not as pollution, like we're polluting the earth with our concrete, right? So if we can design better skate parks that are more ecologically sound, uh, that's going to be better for future generations, not for us. We can trash the planet and it doesn't really matter, but they literally got lights at Pizzi Skate Park, for example, that are very smart. They use solar power. So it costs the councils less money as well, so it's win-win. Um, and then there are skateboarders uh, that are getting scholarships in America, which I really love with this uh, program called CSEF, so College Education Fund for Skateboarders. 
And what it is, it gives skateboarders scholarships to go study if they want to. And they don't have to study skateboarding per se, but they can be studying medicine. So we need physiotherapists. We need, you know, like you must have gone to a doctor with injuries. And if you had another skater that understood how to rehabilitate yourself to go and like, you know, something a bit weird to rehabilitate um, yourself, you know, why wouldn't you want that? To psychologists, right? We have huge mental health issues in skateboarding. Some of the work that I do has raised money for men's mental health because, you know, like suicide, uh, you know, like I said, I guess some sort of content warning, but there's definitely things like, uh, you know, depression and mental health issues and we could do more suicide prevention amongst skate crews um, as well. So getting people to study uh, what works and what can be really helpful and also talking to people and getting that sort of information uh, into the practice so the people that are doing the you know social work or whatever like having that skater in form is going to be really helpful to everybody so yeah my, my PhD in sociology is um, very adaptable just to looking at society and um, being interested in how what we do can be done in a you know more sort of cooler way so everyone wins. So what was your focus when you did your PhD what was your focus question I guess that, that <laughs> don't they usually have that yeah like, yeah a driving question Oh, yeah, my, my PhD wasn't in skateboarding. It was actually in um, looking at family studies and my own background of being adopted from overseas. And it wasn't until I finished my PhD a bit after that I was encouraged to do skateboarding studies. And that's where I could apply what I learned in sociology to the world of skateboarding. And, um, yeah, that's that was my topic. Yeah. <laughs> you met my dad. He's a white man. <laughs> He's, like, not my biological dad. And my accent's not Vietnamese and, yeah, I'm pretty much, you know, raised Aussie. <laughs> do, you, do you mind if we delve into your early life? <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. So you were born in Vietnam? Mm, not bored about it. Were you born in Vietnam? Uh, yeah, so I was born so, in Vietnam during the war in yes. the 70s, yep. in, um, put in an orphanage in uh, Saigon and then moved to the World Vision. If people know World Vision, um, I was do moved to one of their hospitals. So you, do you, how old were you when you were orphaned? Um... So I think I was found at the orphanage young and I got really dodgy, sketchy uh, documents from the war. Like so you were found? Well, yeah, I don't, have a, I don't have a good origin story. Like some people okay. know how they turned up to the orphanage and I, I don't have that info. I've got how paperwork. Old, how, do you roughly know how old you were? Oh, just a baby. Wow, like, okay. So your parents were victims of the American war? They, yeah. yeah, yeah, well... It, you know, everything's context in life and the Vietnamese are, you know, sort of stressed community and torn apart from the war. So there's South Vietnamese here that call it the Vietnam War because they're allies of Australians. And then there are the Vietnamese, Vietnamese in Vietnam that call it the American War because they saw it as an invasion. So, you know, you talk to people from different sides of Vietnam, you'll get a different look at what the war meant to them and it's complicated. Wow. I mean... It's it's quite confronting I considering think. the life that Darren and I were so privileged to be born into. Okay. I feel like Thanks. we've been quite privileged to be born in this country and, and not have to have, ex, you know, experienced that upheaval that you experienced. Okay. So as a baby, mm. you were t in an orphanage and mm. what, how long were you in the orphanage for? Um, well, let, let me just... Thank you for your empathy and your time out to ask me these questions. I don't talk about it that much, so if I don't answer your questions like easily. But I want to clarify. I, yeah, yeah. I, I hope it's not triggering for you. No, no, it's all good. Uh, okay. I just, um, I'm just, uh, you know, buying a bit of time while I think about. Okay, and and also just thanking you because, like, you know, that's what we're all about connecting our stories. And while I was born in a war, like, you know, you can be born here and have all kinds of, like, dramas and pain and trauma. Like, we've all been through stuff and it's 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 because we're skaters, I think, you know, we're able to talk about this because we're so resilient. If you throw yourself on concrete and off stairs and, like, drop in some bowl for the first time for six feet knowing you could die from it. And I was talking about trying to learn to skate switch and not having that reflex of, like, falling like a cat when you get chalked. And, like, when I skate switch, I have no reflex and smashing my cheekbone. It's like, you know, we're so resilient. Like, talking about this stuff I love, is... I love how you put a skate context to every <laughs> single thing. 
Like everything's true, though, isn't it? Like, <laughs> like I'm a war orphan and it's like throwing yourself down 10 stairs. <laughs> <laughs> We're just so resilient. Well, maybe that's why I'm attracted to skating. Like I, I, I tend to, and I was talking to Billy from um, No Negative magazine, like Zine, he was like saying Legend. that. Legend. Yeah, like skating can be like, um, you know, like we turn to it, right? We turn to skating for solace and sanctuary in things that society doesn't give, which is a bit deep, but like. I feel we're drawn to skating because it helps us make, you know, get time out from thinking about tough stuff and it gives us a sanctuary. And, um, yeah, so anyway, back to the orphanage, I was there pretty young. Um, my um, I, origin story is just a bit, you know, hazy, that's all. And you never had any information about your parents? I've got on my birth certificate that my mum was a, um, I think they called it a servant back then, but probably the proper word now is maid. So she was a maid and I'm super proud of my mother and my origins and it says father unknown and um, yeah, you know, like I was at the orphanage for a while and nobody came to get me so I'm figuring it's just fate at that time that I was at the orphanage that, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, we weren't able to be reunited before the end of the war. What What are your memories of the orphanage like? Do you have any? Um, I was so young, was right? It? I got reports from the orphanage that I was, <laughs> again, being skaters. I was really independent and apparently we weren't, like, meant to break out of our cots and I, I learned to break out of mine really early. And then I would go and, like, help myself to all the toys and build, like, my own little world <laughs> in the middle of the floor because I just got bored and... Um, I think one of the interesting things was that when I got adopted, my mum said I didn't cry. And like most children, when they babies, like, you know, or the baby's crying or whatever, like if I'd fall or whatever would happen to me, I, was, I, I just didn't know how to cry because babies learn that the behaviour that they have gets rewards when they're young. And at the orphanage, if you cried, you wouldn't get attention. So there's no point in crying. So I just didn't know how to cry. So that was an interesting one. Like my brothers would stub their toe and cry. I just had no purpose for it. And um, the other thing is that I think, and this is a weird one, but a lot of the babies at the orphanage are very agreeable because if you're if you're an agreeable baby, you get fed maybe because the nurses are pretty busy in that. So I feel like adoptees as a community where we're pretty adaptable to strangers and we maybe like skaters, we're a bit charming to the public. Like, you know, when you're in trouble and the security want to move you on, like the most charming people I've ever met are skateboarders where when they're talking to some shop owner or mum, if you're not yelling, if not that secu press kind of like aggressive stage, pretty, skaters are pretty charming to the public. And um, then when you're back, you like work with your homies, you're like, you know, swear words and your beers out and everything else. And I feel like, yeah, as orphans and as adoptees, we're very adaptable and um, we love meeting other people because we had to rely on that for survival from day one, like being it's kind survival, to strangers. survival mechanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To and be, just being pleasant, not being too confrontational. Like when you're confrontational, is like not going to get us fed. So yeah, because yeah. I, I remember my first memories. Yeah, I would have been like three. I have these vivid memories of oh, yeah. being on the veranda of our first house. Yeah, I came over and, before I was that age. So. Right. So yeah. your first memories, mm. your first recall, yeah, is from Australia. Yeah, I think so. You know, yeah, there's there's kids I know like. I belong to a big adoptee Vietnamese community and there's kids that came over at five and they've got memories. But even then they're like dreams, you know. Like They're like dreams? Until you're about five, literally your your memories before them are pretty scattered and impressions. At what age do you feel like you looked at your adoptive parents yeah. and realised that they appeared different to you? <laughs> at five when I went to school and everyone said, oh, why are your parents like a different race from you? I was like, no way, what do you mean? Like, I literally thought we were all like from the same bloodline. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Like, <laughs> you got me there. Like, they are a different colour, but I, like, they didn't raise us to say, well, she's the Asian kid and we're the white people. So you didn't learn that until you went to school. And, you know, school's brutal, like the playground. So, so your parents didn't prep you for it? Well, back then it was the right thing to do not to point out how different. Like, we were in a country that multiculturalism was pretty new. Like, this is the 70s. Everybody thought assimilation was the thing to do. And so if you bring a child up in a white home in Australia, you thought like treating the child as the same was probably the best thing. And it wasn't done for malice. It was literally done as like, you know, you're one of us. It was a real equalizing thing, which, um, you know, as we know now, it's probably not the best way to raise a child that's physically different from you because they'll get bullied and they'll get surprised at age five. 
and they won't know other people of their own race and culture to go and, you know, learn from and feel strength from. So now we know it's better to raise kids multicultural if you adopt them from another culture. But back then, you know, it was pretty much, you know, um, treat everybody the same. So a colorblind sort of approach. And, and we know that doesn't work now for a long time, but it definitely back then was just done from trying to be treat everyone as equal. Did they ever express to you why they had the desire to adopt? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so you met my dad. He, 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 he's fine either way. Like you could literally say to my dad, you know, like, um, you know, can we can we build um, an Eiffel Tower in the lounge room? You go, yeah, that's a good idea. Like he's just chill. And but my mum, she it was actually my grandmother. She was a a Vietnam War protester back in the day, and she was like really radical, kind of cool person that was always into uh, welcoming. Like we had, you know, she had like Tibet, Tibetan monks in a home, and um, she was a, one of the founders of my orphanage. Actually, she funded it, so I owe my life to my adoptive grandmother. And my mother, she wanted to have a daughter and she'd already had two sons. And um, my grandmother just said, you know, look, um, you know, the war's going to end soon and we don't know how safe these kids are going to be. And as far as we know, they don't have, you know, family checking in on them. So, you know, um, if you'd consider adoption, you know, maybe that's an option. And, um, you know, again, like I, I've written my PhD on the problems and the issues around adoption. But back then, if we put things in context, it was actually really... Uh, it all made sense. So my mother flew over to Vietnam during the middle of the war, went to my orphanage and um, met me. And, uh, you know, I just was really chill, she said. <laughs> just, everyone looked a bit scared of this white lady in the room, whereas I, I kind of looked her in the eye and said, yeah, you know, like, you know, let's hang and <laughs> let's be chill together. And um, she, she hung out with me for a while and um, she had to fly back to Australia and do all the legal stuff. And then I came out with a um, World Vision flight with kids getting operations from the war. So it was like a, a humanitarian flight with um, kids getting operations for free and uh, another kid that was orphaned and, yeah, it was cool. Wow. Do they have other children? Do you have any brothers and sisters? Me. I've got yeah. two uh, brothers that are biological to my white family. So, yeah. So I was the only Asian in the family, but I've got two, like, brothers that are older. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's cool. You've taken an academic pathway in your life mm. and you're very well accomplished. <laughs> you know, I mean, you've, you've achieved, you've received an Order of Australia medal. Yeah, I did. And you've done extensive community work. <laughs> I know you've had some involvement with Skater Stand. Yeah, Is that yeah. correct? And what drives you to do these things? Is it a yeah. feeling of ina uh, inadequacy? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question and a good answer. It's always not feeling like I deserve to be here, right? So it's like, not that I don't deserve to be like living and stuff, but they call it survivor's guilt in a lot of cases. Like if somebody survives a I don't know, plane wreck or say a house burns down, somebody survives, like they get really guilty and happens with a lot of refugees when, you know, some of them make it out and some don't. So similar to me, like I just got that survivor's guilt of why me and why do I have, you know, food and shelter and nice things around me. And I just want to not take that for granted. I want to give back and pay people, not pay people in general, but I, I want to be mindful of everything that I have and not be flam um, not be forgetful. So I, I, everything I do, I see it as community. Firstly, because I don't, like I have an adoptive family, but I don't have a family. Like I literally had to make a family of strangers. So I see everybody as potential family. So Growing up, you know, like, um, yeah, if, if I, I, I was surrounded by white people, right, so I had to learn to make family of people that are different from me. So I already see people in terms of a community and that strangers being kind can help people survive. So, yeah, basically that's my <laughs> that's me, why I do what I do. I'm, I'm very driven just to give back and to just be very mindful that, you can always make a difference at even the smallest gesture. So why not do it? You just said strangers being kind can help people survive. Mm. It's pretty deep. <laughs> so we're getting really deep. <laughs> I guess. It's beautiful. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially in a society where there's there's a lot of tension in our society right now. Yeah, for, people for get variety. stressed, hey. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And I really feel like the Matilda's situation was kind of something that our country needed right now. Yeah, yeah see women's sport. That was cool. Yeah, I feel like a bit of one together. What do you reckon, Dags? 
Uh, it did for sure. Yeah, everyone was, was into it. Mm. Uh, but I'm yeah. more I'm curious actually. Can I just butt in well, about mm. this Order of Australia medal? Oh can we God. hear more about that? <laughs> like, how do you get one of those? You can't just what, you don't you just gotta, apply. You got to be nominated. There's, and there's, there's a whole like big long story about my medal in the Order of Australia oh, for it. All right. Well, well, firstly, I, I did get a medal in the Order of Australia. They they've got like tiers, so you could have like tiers of um the community people get the medal in the Order of Australia that OAM, which is what I got. Then as you get more posher and more status and really like the posher, famous people posher. get the ACs, I think, which is a <laughs> companion or something in the Order of Australia. So I've got like the community level one for people that do like a lot of grassroots work and just um, you get it for going beyond what is expected in your role. So just really going for it and doing something out of the ordinary for a community. And I got that for starting off a network called Adopted Vietnamese International which talking about the war and people being adopted, it, it can be a pretty isolating, lonely experience. And there's, uh, people just want to know where they're from and they want to know, like every time you look in the mirror, you want to know what happened to your family because you're reminded of yourself looking in the mirror that there are other people that created you and that you might not be connected with. So I started off a network for that. And we've got a 1,000 members still in the Facebook group. I started it in, the I think, the 25th anniversary of the Vietnam War. It's been running for 20 years and on Facebook, every single week, people are still saying, I'm looking for family or I want to go to Vietnam and find people. So it was for that, right? And um, that was in 2006, just after I think my son was born. So in the when I got the Melanie of the Australia at the ceremony, I was like, you know, carrying a baby still. And it was really cool, like nice to have that shiny medal. But I actually gave it back in 2021. So I've resigned from the Medal of the Order of Australia. So, okay, okay, why? So this is why I said there's a long story okay. about it. Mm. And it's, it's public, right? So um, in 2021, they gave the highest tier of the medals, um, which I think is an AC, to Margaret Court, who's a tennis player, but she's also known for being pretty homophobic and transphobic and saying, you know, gay people the devil and that kind of thing, allegedly saying, so I don't get sued. Um, <laughs> but, like, she's... You know, she's she, she's got a view. She's allowed to do that. She's a great tennis player. Not everybody has to agree with me. And, um, you know, I, I had somebody on the bus ask me if I was woke. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, man. Like, you want to label me just for what I'm, you know, just generally everybody having a right to be chill and not be picked on than whatever. But um, Margaret Court, anyway, a, a whole bunch of people started giving back their OAMs, including uh, Kerry O'Brien from the ABC, so journalists. Uh, all these woke people, probably all these left-wing people, but like, you know, people that just thought, nah, like, you don't need to give... Uh, she already had a medal in the Order of Australia anyway for her tennis achievements and nobody's throwing shade on that, but if you're going to give people medals to being role models in sports and you've got someone that's homophobic and transphobic to people, like, you can you can be chill with that or you can, like, say, no, that's not in my ethical world, so I'm going to make a stance... And it was just standing up for something. So I gave it back with a bunch of other people that gave back their medals in the Order of Australia. I wrote a letter to the um, Australia, I think, the, what was it, the Honours Council, mm. explaining why. Um, I, you know, basically joined a momentum of people saying, you know, like, it's something important to do with my medal other than just wearing it around and cutting ribbons from ceremonies. Like, yeah. So I gave it back just on a stance for standing up for queer people. Did and you get a response from them? You don't get a res- – well, they say, you know, like, can you please mail the medal back? <laughs> but like, no, do you get a response as to, okay, we accept your resignation? Yeah, yeah. So they – We're disappointed or something along those no, lines? No, no. They, well, they kind of say that they put it in the Gazette, so it's like announced formally. But they're, they're not a political organisation per se. And um, it was more just to show – because it was a momentum at the time, it was just a way to take a stance. Because I've got mates that I skate with that are, you know, um, trans and – you know, I'm from Asia, like it's it's no big deal. For years and years and years, like people have been going to Thailand making jokes about, you know, ladyboys or whatever. Like literally there are beautiful people in Thailand that just, you know, are themselves and you can label them derogatory stuff or whatever or, you know, maybe we just accept that there are trans people on earth and that some of them skate as well and it was just a way to uh, show my homies and show everybody really that, you know, we shouldn't, we don't necessarily need to, uh, reward people for being mean to people and excluding them and for, you know, just um, whatever you believe in. You know, it, it might be like, you you know, people have given up Nobel Prizes because of uh, positions of ethics of theirs. 
uh, Muhammad Ali stood mm. up for the Vietnam War and lost his championships by not going to there. Yep. It's basically Tom Carroll. Tom Carroll wouldn't travel to South Africa at yeah, the height fight. of his surfing career while yeah. he was world champion. Yeah, it was just that long history of sport and, you know, taking a stance on something. Same with that, like, black guy that um, in the Olympics with Hitler or, like, they did the power, the mm-hmm. black power sign and there was some strain. On the podium. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he held up, the two, held up a Owens. black fist. Jesse Owens won, I think, when the um, in Berlin, I think, was held during the Nazis. But there was another time where they had a political first protest. And second, first and second yeah. held up their, held up their fist. Which was quite... Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we can put that in the notes later, what that was. But it's definitely, yeah, I mean, people have given up a lot in sport uh, and status by just drawing attention to something they believe in and it's usually human rights. Yeah, so because I, I, I think activism is so necessary and, and so positive and it's how change occurs, correct? So by doing that, it was your way to activate change in what is recognised. Yeah, yeah, there's like guys, you know, it's probably not public enemy that said it first, but, you know, like stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, a bit of public enemy, enemy energy. and That's pretty punk. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Again, like skaters don't, we don't need trinkets, right? <laughs> Literally, like, you know, sure, X, context. X Games is, is fun and fine, but like those people are going to be skaters with or without some medal. And in fact, they probably have more fun down at a local session with their homies and mates. Than they do in that high pressured thing where they've got TV so. cameras yeah. and mm. well, they did it do. make a change like taking the stance? Um, it it gives and it, it didn't know because Margaret Court still got hers, <laughs> yeah. so not not in the broader sense that you know they might have changed that because uh, the ideal would have been they said oh yeah we made a mistake and she's very mean whatever but you know it does draw attention it gives me occasions like talking to Shan and and you Darren about some things that maybe you know a lot of people don't hear about or haven't had time to think about or just another side like mm. even if you don't agree with me and not you don't have to agree with me like everyone's got their own opinions but like I said to Shan when he wanted to interview me like my greatest goal in life is to understand people not judge them and you know once you can understand where somebody's so coming good. from we can all coexist like uh, you know I've got another strange saying where I think it's like I, I can respect people I don't like but I like can't like people I don't respect. Mm. You really got to yeah. know and understand somebody to build that respect though. Yeah, and we are always going to be faced with those people. I think it's one of our greatest challenges as humans. We could just coexist with people with different yeah. views, you know. Even if you don't agree with them. Yeah, yeah. We we don't have to we don't have to oppress them. No, no, you literally like, you know, um I think there's a saying like at dinner Christmas dinners and dinner parties and whatever religion you're from, like, you know, like don't talk about religion or politics, right? It's yeah. very personal. You can't change somebody and you don't want to go and convert them. You, mm. You've got to coexist some of the time. But don't you, don't, don't you feel that our adversaries can be our greatest teachers? Um, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I reckon. Well, they can because they can show you the other end of the spectrum yeah. and as uncomfortable it is and there's. I think there is something to learn from that. Yeah, yeah, I'm just having a moment of respect for you, Shan, because you're a teacher and, you know, you've, you've got to experience seeing kids every day with all their, you know, they're, they've got less filters and less barriers and somehow they still, you know, they're learning, they're as sponges and, um, you know, they're, you, you're witnessing them learning life's limits and disappointments and where they should actually break the rules and when they shouldn't. It's, it's kind of cool that you're a skater and a teacher. Like, yeah, no, but I think we need to dance on the boundaries to progress. Fa- failure is good for us too, yeah. right? Not always hearing what our own side, so you're right. Yeah. But I think in today's society, if you go too far one way, you're automatically labelled as radical or extremist. <laughs> labels are I, – I hate labels, hey. But like, it's occurring all the time. Yeah, yeah. If we just sort of, um, you know, kind of remember that labels are historical, like, mm. you know, literally in the past, like things that are illegal – now or legal now won't in the past. So if somebody, I don't know, had a had a joint, had a bong in front of you, like you'd label them as criminal. But once you take away that and make it legal and you realise that people that have cancer or like, you know, maybe, a, you know, have you know, sort of mental uh, conditions where marijuana is really good for them, they're not criminals, right? So it's labelling is um, very powerful and we just need to be really aware of it, I reckon. It's pr- and it's very oppressive though, uh, conversely. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's what sort of challenges me. I mean, I hear things all the time that I don't like. Hmm. But do I automatically dismiss that person as a bad person? 
Uh, that's yeah. that's my question to you. Like, <laughs> do you? I, <laughs> You're sort of looking at Darren. I mean, I don't know. Uh, like, well, I mean, Darren, Darren and I have had a few chats about, um, you know, how skating's changed and... I don't know, Darren. <laughs> you, you've seen the change more. Like, I, I'm kind of in this position where I'm I'm very keen to be open, and you know, like I, I feel like I'm. Is it like I, I said to somebody that read my book, like it would change you from a bloke to woke if you're not careful? as a joke, you know. That was a poem. <laughs> bloke to woke. I've been told I'm woke, and I didn't actually know the context of woke. I still don't know what that means. Well, neither do I. I'm like, oh, you're woke. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm talking about my feelings and shit. Mm. I, I, I don't know, maybe um, just sort of throw it down a bit on that one and then I'll just ponder it. What do you reckon, Darren? What we Have we got something to learn from the people we don't like? Um. <laughs> Have I stumped I everyone? So. Definitely, don't we? Like, I mean, everyone's what got a different sh- opinion. Or do we shut them down? I, yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, man, I, it's a tough one. <laughs> I don't – I don't I try not to affiliate with the people that I uh, don't see eye to eye with that much, okay. to be honest. So for your own piece, you choose – you choose where you get your information from and who would, you associate would, would with. Would Darren hang out with me if I didn't skate? <laughs> That's a good question. Hmm. I just, I, I think just so. think in the in terms. Yeah. Of would, would you hang out with me if we didn't skate? That was thrown at me. We threw Wait, at you. When did you identify as a skateboarder? Like, I identify as a skateboarder <laughs> because you, you yeah, always yeah, refer back to this a lot, and it's just like, I mean, hmm? yeah, you refer to this skateboarding skateboarder yeah. being a skateboarder. They've yeah, got yeah. different perspectives on things. Yeah, like when yeah, you it does. First Probably. I mean, how long were you skateboarding before you identified as a skateboarder? True, it's a good question. No, no, honestly, like, um, you feel like a poser, like, for the first year because, you know, you're apologising all the time to every skater you meet. Like, oh, even now when I, I met Linda, like, when I met, like, you know, meet new skaters at the park, I say, oh, I warned them, like, I'm not very good. You need a disclaimer, like, you know, because they say, oh, how long have you skated? And I said, oh, 10 years, but I'm not very good. And, yeah, so I feel like... In the past, it was harder to identify as a skater because there's so much gatekeeping and there's like this core thing like that trick's illegal and don't touch your board and don't like, you know, like even now, like if, if somebody pushes in a certain way, oh, like, you know, I, I don't want to like hate yeah. all day on somebody that like, you know, might Mongo so push, much, yeah. all that kind of thing bring was much back, more. Bring back Mongo push. <laughs> like, you I'm, know. I'm going to make it cool again. That's my mission. 2024. I mean, it, it's cool. It, it, it's important push. when you're maybe 12 years old in the 90s, but we've, you know, like, and, and that's some of the skateboarding culture that was inherited for a long time, right? Like, you know, sort of that sort of this is illegal, that isn't. And, um, you know, people like me are just at the, the the far end of the Brian Anderson coming out and like skateboarding, having more women on the teams and having some different perspectives on that. So it was easy to say I'm a skateboarder once. You know, like we had more women on the cover of Thrasher and Lizzie Armanto might have been on Birdhouse and, um, you know, because if you've only got like Alyssa Steamer and like maybe one skateboarder every 20 years on the cover of Thrasher, you know, already you're kind of feeling like a bit like outside the culture that you love. And so it became easy to identify as a skateboarder, say, you know, like saying I'm a skateboarder. Uh, once you've got others that are in the realm of what you do, they might skate like you, they might dress like you, they might talk like you might look like you um you know Letitia Buffoni I think just got so much uh shit on her and so much hate simply because she was one of the only women skateboarders getting attention who was she getting the hate from you think predominantly um oh you know I mean like even if you look at some of the slap magazine and look at the comments on some of the skating now like some of the girls if they skate in a bikini top like there's just so much hate still I guess from, really, I, I don't yeah. see it. Maybe I don't read comments, but yeah, a lot of it's more what, just what, what sort of comments are being made. Like, ah, oh. yeah, you just you're just doing it for attention, and okay. it's, it's like, well, you know, like everyone is posting on Instagram for attention. Like any guy that skates puts his clip on there, hmm. unless it's totally private and he has two followers. You know, he's showing off his body. <laughs> it's like, you know, attention is, doesn't have to be negative. It can be like co- positive encouragement. It can mm. be finding other people to connect with. Like I put a lot of stuff on the gram, not because I think I'm an awesome skater, but it would be very hard for me to find other middle-aged women that skate like I do, uh, that are, you know, maybe Asian, maybe Vietnamese. Like it just helps me find other people that get my vibe and I get theirs. Yeah, but I think like someone like the teacher, like she just, she shuts, she shuts things down. She skates yeah. so good. You know, and just, I almost feel yeah. like if you skate good, it just overrides everything. You can wear whatever you want and it's just all of a sudden. Yeah. She had a lot of pressure on her though because she was just one of the few women skaters that was in the public eye. And now that there's so many, you know, it takes the pressure off her and she can just be herself because she hasn't mm. changed, right? Yeah. 
uh, she's our authentic self. And again, like I said, as long as you're your authentic self, like, you know, I think that like there's teenage girls now that skate and they're very pretty and there's teenagers that model and maybe they're not the best skaters. And I think there's room for all of that now. Yeah. I would much rather see a model selling me, I don't know, Roxy or whatever, some kind of, you know, uh, streetwear that can kickflip than seeing, you know, somebody that doesn't skate, but they're, they're gorgeous, right? Like, you know, we're at this stage now, I'm, I'm happy if the model skates and she's having fun to think, okay, we connect and that inspires me to buy that product. But that wasn't possible in the past, right? Like they're literally only like total models or, you know, uh, mm. people that, you know, you wouldn't identify with because they only like would skate Wallenberg or they'd only yeah. like do like 10 stairs on a rail. And it's like that doesn't connect with every buyer of skateboards either. So it's just nice to have the variety. Yeah. I've got a question, but I don't know if it's like – uh, offensive, and I don't want to offend everyone. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I embrace for this one, Darren. Get no, offensive. yeah. How would you? How how would you? Where would you place yourself on the feminist spectrum? Oh, okay, that's not offensive. Yes. Really well, you can do better than that. Okay. Well, I want no, no, no. you can be more, way more offensive. Thanks, and then I'll throw to Darren and say, and Darren would like to answer that well, one first. I, I guess, like, I don't want to. Fem- I don't want to label anyone. I no, don't I don't want to label. I don't want to label you in any way. <laughs> Thank you. You know, and but I, I want to. Yeah. I'm trying to learn here. Oh yeah, hey, tell you me know, where are you on this? Where are you on the spectrum? I yeah. like to believe in um, people just you know using whatever mental or intellectual or social tools they can to just be treated nicely, right? So I, I I don't walk around saying I'm a feminist, and I don't. In theoretical literature, the majority of my work doesn't actually engage with feminist theory. I write a lot about masculinity and men's culture just because I believe that, you know, communicating with people that are the people that you need to get on with, like preaching to the converted is just no big deal. You need to talk to people that are different to you and that you want to get on with. So um, I understand what feminism is good for and it's certainly drawn attention to a lot of sexism and stuff, but I hate labels and, you know, feminism itself was developed by different types of people that, uh, it served a purpose at the time. Like if you want to vote and you're not allowed to vote because you're a woman, feminism's great, right? If you want to uh, get equal pay for a skate competition, maybe you label that as feminism. Maybe that's good for you to collaborate with people that are behind equal pay for something like a skate competition. Or maybe you just connect because people think it's fair and it's like the right thing to do. And I'm probably more on the spectrum of just really believing in human rights, equality, and letting people be different and express themselves. So, I, I, like I said, being adopted across races and ethnicities and growing up knowing that everything we label means nothing really <laughs> to a child and it's it's also socially constructed and historically contextualised in different ways, I, I just don't label myself and others. So you, can I call you a social justice warrior? No, God, no. I, no. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm pretty much into this social um, people having justice and people being social and, you know, like, hell yeah, go and be a warrior. That's a cool word actually. It sounds cool. Like you from Mad Max 3 or something, like, you know, Tina Turner in a metallic bra, like in a space car, but I don't like labels, right? And social justice warrior is kind of like you sit around all day bothering people to do the right thing. I'm not like that. I I just want people to hang out, chill, think about how they would like to be treated and just act that out. Mm. That's that's really Okay. That's really like the best way to look at it too. The minute you start like in my book with I wrote with Anthony, you know, um which is some um, called Social Power Change, I think I can't remember what it's called. I don't called. know the name of your book. Skateboarding. I <laughs> know <laughs> oh, I've forgotten the name. Skateboarding no. power and change. I, I've, I've got like a busy, you sure you wrote busy this? week. Which, for the record, for the record, the, if you scroll down in this episode, show notes, there's a link to that book, and I highly recommend you read it because it's amazing. But keep going. Oh, sweet. Me Thank and Dags are talking about the skate park. Like, it kind of just sums up everything we've always felt about skateboarding, but was unable <laughs> to articulate. But anyway, keep going. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I. I didn't use the word activist in the book, right? We purposely didn't use that. We 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 recognise that people can be activists and advocates and feminists and you know all these other things, social justice warriors. But we we called people change makers instead because that umbrella term literally says the action of what people do. It doesn't label people into feeling like they belong to any radical group or that they are you know really conservative and you know want to go through legal means of being advocates like. Change making, like if something needs changing, these are the people that just go out there and just get shit done. Like 
let's go and make yes. change. So yes. uh, again, I, I purposely didn't like those labels because people may be turned away and turned off by those labels as well. Like, you know, if you if you want to watch the Women's World Cup there and, and they say, you know, it's like a feminist event, like maybe, not you personally, but like, you know, we're just saying because the audience was so great. If it was called the feminist soccer game, maybe people wouldn't watch it, you know. It was just like mm. a good soccer game, wasn't it? Like the, the audience speaks. You can't make those figures up that it made that many people view it. Mm. But it was, it was more like the love of soccer and, yeah, women are cool and, yeah, men are cool at doing it. But it was literally like enjoyable to watch. It was, it was, you know, yeah. it was really cool. Oh, the, the standard was amazing. Yeah, so I mean, you regardless you know, of gender. Yeah, that's it. So I, I, I just kind of like that approach as well. Like, where's the joy and where's the connection and where's the change that needs to be done? I mean, I like to surf mm. as well, and I tell you what, man, surfing is sexist. Yeah, the, the WSL they'll have these events, they have these two week waiting periods, and it's mm. you know they 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 put the event on and off hold depending on the conditions. They wait for the swell, they wait for the right wind, they wait for the right tide. And then when it's all when all the everything lines up, the men event the men's event is on. It's mm. on, you know, the surf's pumping, the wind's offshore, mm. it's perfect conditions. As soon as the conditions change, the wind goes on shore, the waves drop off, they send the women out for their event. Yeah, yeah, that sucks. Yeah, it's really I find it really interesting. And what I find interesting is like female surfers and the way they surf is so eloquent and different mm. to a man. And for me, way more as well as aesthetically pleasing. If yeah. not more, I've always found that really interesting. I just wanted to highlight that while you're here. Just yeah, yeah. like you know, like you know, I don't know if there's always a gender difference, but like style matters in skating and surfing, right? And, yeah, you know, like some of the style that you see across genders is, um, you know, it's it's a beautiful thing. Like you've seen a thousand front rocks; it doesn't always have to be an NBD. Like a, you know, like a front rock's like pretty much everyone's seen one, right? But you see somebody do like a steezy one, they're just a thing of beauty or a back tail. You think, yeah, like, you know, look at that. Like, I, I feel that's what we're seeing in women's sport. It's just that people have an opportunity to like tune in because it's, you know, maybe it's just seen as, um, you know, inferior to men where it could just be different to men, right? So is the term skate like a girl an offensive term? Um, Great question, Darren. So there's an organisation that even makes fun of that term. Like they call themselves Skate Like a Girl, ironically. Mm. Um, and it depends who's saying it. Like in the past, yeah, it was derogatory. It's like, oh, you know, they, they skate like a girl, like it was inferior. But if you are saying you skate like Chloe Cavell or is it true, bring it on. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. I want to skate like them. <laughs> Risa Leo. Do girls, girls do skate like differently. They do have a different yeah. style and they a pro- different way, way different. to do it. So yeah, I, I don't think it's an offensive term at all. So was, that's why I asked. Yeah, it just depends who's saying it, you know, if you're mm. being a dick or you're being like, you know, just making an observation. There's a, always context, isn't it? Context is everything. Speaking of context, I took my eight-year-old daughter and my five-year-old son to the Barbie movie the other night. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Mm. Haven't you? No, no, I can't. Mm. Is it a kid's movie? No. That's what it I It is heard, in no yeah. way a kid's movie. It's yeah. PG. I was like, oh, yeah. it's PG, great. Because, you know, as a yeah. parent, I, I look at ratings now and I, and uh, I had a very hard time afterwards explaining to my five-year-old son what the term patriarchy meant. Yeah, yeah. And also had to explain to my five-year-old son why Ken was so dumb. Okay. Yeah. It really is a very breakthrough movie. There's okay, no doubt about I, I, I it. Have you taken it. your daughter? I haven't seen it. I don't, I'm not going to take her to see it. You're not going to no, take it? No. Okay. No, I won't. But. Fair enough. Yes, I haven't seen it. But you yeah. know, Have you heard much about it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Hmm. I'll, I'll, I'd be really interested if Barbie movies weren't so unusual. I think that's just a big deal because that is that kind of emphasis on maybe women's, you know, having a women focus and that feminist thing and patriarchy. Like, you know, if those kind of things were just like normalised concepts and, you know, you pretty much didn't make a big deal about them, it wouldn't be so controversial. But I think it's just because that film... You know, it was one of the few to, to do it in a mainstream film that, you know, people are so surprised by it. And, you know, it's just a film as well. Like, I feel like the biggest thing we need to avoid is telling people what to think. Like, people should make up their own decisions, you know, and um, you should never underestimate what means things to people. And bottom line is, uh, again, like, we, we have to coexist and we learn this at the skate park. Yeah. So if I have a fight with somebody in Brizzy, there's like four skate parks that we mainly skate. We're going to see each other again. Like mm. it's not like we can just cancel each other and never see each other again. It's like the next day and <laughs> the next 12 years, we'll be skating the same four parks. So mm. it's like 
learn to learn to have the courage to say what you think. Learn not to feel like everybody should believe the same things you do. And just learn to coexist is um, pretty much going to be a key to how we all get on in society as well, I reckon. Not just being right. Yeah, that's right. We don't have to be right. right. (laughs) Ironically, that's right. Is this hypothetical or have you actually had experience of conflict with people at skate parks in Brisbane? Who hasn't? Like, we're all human. Like, yeah. with skaters. I'm a full I don't think I've ever had person. real conflict with skaters at a skate park or skates. Well, <laughs> I've had conflict with surfers. Yeah, yeah. You, you can. In the surf. Yeah, well, you know, so there's only four beaches you're going to get swell at half the time on the northern beaches if you're from here. So, same thing. You've got to like see each other again. Mm. So, the, the, that's all. The, I don't believe in cancelling people. I believe that you have to get on and like people can improve their behaviour. Mm. But certainly, you know, this whole thing about just getting rid of somebody and feeling like they, they disappear conveniently is just fiction and it's not very helpful. Yeah, I, I guess like I, I did want to bring up the Barbie movie thing just because I, I'm feeling like the term patriarchy is very divisive. Yeah, yeah, it could uh, be like a big scary word like, you know. But it, I, I just think it's divi- It's just making a big – every time it's used, it's just making the – it's highlighting – something negative and it's just creating a bigger divide. And I love what you said, how you kept reinforcing that we have to coexist and there's no benefit to. Yeah. I mean, you know, it depends to like context again, like if we're sitting down looking at policy Mm. and looking at the way that taxes go or looking at something like, uh, you know, the, the barriers towards, you know, women advancing in the workplace or something, then, you know, then those terms patriarchy might have a, really pivotal meaning mm. and it's put in its place, right? You you don't just pull out patriarchy in the middle of a playground or you don't just pull out this, you know, word patriarchy, you know, like hanging out with your friends. Mm. And, you know, it's the same with capitalism. Like, you know, you literally can sit down and look at the way that we exploit people that make our iPhones like and our shoes, like Nike, like that's capitalism. The 12-year-olds making our shoes and not getting paid much. But I don't pull out the word capitalism when I say, hey, man, I love your shoes and that's capitalism. Like there's got context. You're perpetuating capitalism. Yeah. You're participating. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like you've got to look at what what change you want. This is why I'm back to change making. Like it might be, hey, cool shoes. And, you know, like wouldn't it be great if they, um, you know, like they paid their workers fucking, excuse my language, paid their workers more, right? I can't believe you swore on my podcast. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if people paid? You know, people like, you know, more and like, which shoe company does? Do you know any? Like just asking questions. Darren's great. He keeps asking questions like, what do you think? And like, he's not, you know. How was the word patriarchy used in the Barbie movie? I'm curious. Uh, down with the patriarchy. Uh, <laughs> not context. Like what? Yeah, yeah. But the context is it's like Barbie versus Mattel, right. the brand, and a board of directors, which are all male which the head of the board of directors is played by Will Ferrell (laughs) and Barbie leaves Barbie world Mm. and goes to the real world where in Barbie world, they're Are these spoilers? Well, yeah, it's a spoiler. (laughs) Uh, And in Barbie world, they flip the the script where uh, the president of Barbie world is a female and the, the women are in control of every aspect of Barbie world, but then they, Ken and Barbie venture into the real world and they go to Venice beach and, Barbie's getting wolf whistles from dudes at on work sites at lunchtime and Ken realises that men are in charge in the real world and then that power goes to his head and he goes back to Barbie world and tries to, yeah, you know, right. take yeah. over Barbie world. Well, see, the right. thing is it's you, not, like, it's not, not, child not a kid's movie. Yeah. You, you don't but, want it either way, like one but, person to have more power than the other, right? Yeah, and it's multi. It's, look, there's way more layers to it yeah. and I think ultimately it has a really good message and I have an eight-year-old daughter and I wanted yeah. her to get those downloads, like... I want her to be an empowered, independent, strong female. I do. Yeah, it's, it's like the most uh, profitable film, so it resonates with a lot of people. It's hit, it's hidden. It's it, a lot of it. And, didn't and we shouldn't. Said, yeah, we shouldn't get hung up on yeah. on on words. Like, yes, that word's there. The, the better question is, what? How does that word have any use? And if it has the use of like making you think about, you know, like well, all the men were like, you know, in charge. And maybe men and women and and other people, non-binary people, should be in charge. Mm. You know that makes sense. If you think that all men be in charge, then you know the patriarchy will, you know, probably be your cup of tea. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it hi- it highlights the oppression of women. It, it's just not a word I would use. It, it, it really or, breaks down in layman's yeah, yeah. terms the oppression that women have experienced for such a long time yeah, that yeah. I think a lot of are so ingrained in societies 
that people yeah. just take for granted and just don't understand. And yeah. there's elements of it I don't still don't understand. Yeah, I, yeah. I do not know what it's like to be a female walking down the street and having eyes directed at you all the time, like the wolf whistling thing. Like that doesn't, yeah, you know, they're, doesn't they're happen all good to themes me. Too. It doesn't happen to men. Or women yeah, yeah. being scared to walk to their car at night time and yeah, having yeah. to the, hold their phone in their hand ready to hit triple zero mm. and like they they feel they have those feelings like yeah you now this is really foreign stuff to me oh, okay, as a yeah. male it's, it's, i know it, i know it occurs but i never know what it's yeah. like and the only time i ever feel like i experience it is with um if i'm with a partner yeah and we're yeah. walking down the street and i see i the men's eyes yeah, turn yeah. our direction i'm like what are they looking at i'm like oh they're looking at her yeah, yeah. So, I, so I can't understand what that'd be like day in day out. Yeah, it's it's scary, you know. <laughs> it's, it's not not cool. It's a bit frightening, really. And um, the same with skating, actually. Like, you know, you gotta you gotta like try and think about where. Like, I prefer street skating. I don't actually hang in skate parks much because I think it is a lot of social pressure to be social when you just want to skate. If you skate in the street, you don't also have like measurements of what you should skate. Like, if I'm next to a rail. People have like a whole trictionary, like, oh, board slide, this feeble, grind, yep. front smith, right? If I'm in the street and it's just a gutter like, or a bank, like, you literally can just skate as you want. Do you ever feel patronised by male skaters going, hey, girl, go up and, you know, you gotta, you're not <laughs> doing that feeble right. Like, <laughs> let me show you and, you know, like, I mean, have you ever been hit on by a skater? Or a skater? There's, there's, like, there's a whole bunch of, like, ways that we can just all be better to each other. So. Let's go back to the, the Barbie film and the patriarchy. I haven't seen the Barbie film. I, I feel like the patriarchy has like a, a a sting to it that cannot always, it isn't always helpful to people if you're trying to bring people in. I'm a big believer in calling people in and calling people out. And patriarchy can sound like a bit of a call out or a bit of a stinging term to people that don't understand it. If you're in a room full of people that are on board already and they want to understand how maybe uh, a whole room full of men in the boardroom is wrong and you use the word it might be patriarchal, then it makes sense. Because we have matriarchal societies as well. You know, you might go to the Pacific Islands. There are some societies, I, maybe Polynesian, I don't, I'm, I don't know for sure, but there's definitely other cultures that are matriarchal where the women are in charge, right? So patriarchal and patriarchy, in a sense, you know, it means what it means in certain contexts. So I'm really keen on getting past the labelling and the ways to make people feel guilty to looking at the ways that makes people feel connected and like they can do actionable change and get on with each other. So of course, like, you know, I think any, any woman in a all men space will occasionally get hit on. They'll feel intimidated. They have to check their safety. Like just literally the accounts of sexual violence, like the statistics are pretty high. Um, so of course women have to think about all these things and it's uncool, but you know, I just feel like thinking about ways that we can all make people feel more protected and safer and less stressed out is is totally cool. I don't want to label that again. I just feel like it's just decency, right, to, like, make somebody be able to skate and just say what the, what are their boundaries. Like, I, I, I like skating with you, man, but when you look at me that way, like, it just makes me feel like I'm an idiot. Like, you know, maybe just let me chill and skate for this a while and then offer me the advice if I come to you, yeah, okay. you know, that kind yeah. of thing, like. Like, oh, I appreciate the advice, but, like, I'm just warming up. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. don't judge me on my yeah. first trick tryout. Like, yeah. yeah, just understanding each other, just chilling a bit together is really cool. Yeah. Who are some modern-day sociologists that you look up to and respect? Oh, wow, that's such a good question. Um, so there's some Indigenous First Nations scholars like Arlene Morton Robinson, who is um, from... Uh, Kwandamuka woman uh, up north where I'm from, and she was a mentor to me when I did a masterclass in sociology. Super cool, just really making us mindful again uh, that, you know, it's not terra nullius in Australia, it's Aboriginal land, and that, that everywhere we look there's Aboriginal carvings and we've just been really disrespectful and, you know, um, totally brought up in a culture that wasn't respecting and uplifting, uh, you know, First Nations culture, language, and so on. So Eileen Martin Robinson's a sociologist that writes about that, and she's the only Australian scholar um, that's ever been invited to be a fellow with the American Sociological Association, which is a huge honour. So her scholarship's top-level stuff, uh, so she's cool. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of, like, First Nations writers that are, are really cool, and they write about the stolen generation as well, which really helps me understand my experiences more as well, like being 
transfer to culture and you know no matter it doesn't matter if you had like a great family or a really awful family like you always want to know your culture and where you're from so just the you know uh, efforts to have their people stay connected is really cool I learned a lot from that yeah as, as a high school teacher of it's really helped me understand the the pain and the ongoing anguish that is experienced. Mm, I've yeah. taught students whose grandparents was a stolen generation. Yeah, yeah. And it's I, awful. it's it's very until you actually meet them, it's it's hard to understand the trauma, the intergenerational trauma that's passed, mm. and how it, it's still it, it's it's already it's now gone through two generations. Yeah, you know? and I've you know how how many generations do you think it takes for that kind of trauma to heal oh, or is it ever healed <laughs> well um, not from a first nations uh, perspective because I, I know only they can speak for their own experiences but as a person from a war it's um you know was a lifelong thing that you carry it it never leaves you you're always haunted by ghosts and in fact the Vietnamese they don't make a heavy distinction between the living and the dead and they have lots of festivals and cultural rituals around uh, honoring, you know, the dead and like a ghost week and uh, in Tet, T-E-T, Tet Festival. <laughs> so you say it the wrong way, it sounds really dirty. But like the Tet Festival is like this beautiful ceremony where people leave things up for the dead, like to honor them in their shrines and food and stuff and you know, communicate basically with the spirits because it's like somebody's always watching over you and your ancestors are really important. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't think being removed from your ancestors is a good thing ever. I think that that's something you carry for your life and that you always should respect. And it's like grief, you know, like if somebody loses somebody, like a family member or a loved one, you don't get over grief. It just changes and evolves with you. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. It doesn't leave you. <laughs> it doesn't. And everyone's going to experience it. Mm, that's right, yeah. But there needs to be more maybe grief education. Yeah, yeah. seem to learn the hard way. I've only just experienced it. Mm. Uh, and I'm, you know, we'll continue, we'll experience it again. But. Yeah. Well, I think for like for your listeners, like as well, like just while we're talking, like there's this really cool organization in London called the Ben Ramers Foundation. Oh, uh, yes. It's been advocated for on here before, but yeah, yeah. please go on. Yeah. I mean, you know, so there's a, there's a few, uh, skateboarding groups, I guess, that look at mental health and suicide prevention and things like your emotions and grief are really important. Like don't, don't feel bad about it. Like everyone has the feelings. And so uh, you may not always be in an environment where it's, you know, cool to talk about it, but definitely go online on your phone and look up Ben Raymer's foundation, but also John Ratray. He's such a cool dude. He did this collaboration with Nike um, and, uh, you know, a comic artist. So it's like a, it's like a short video of comics explaining literally like your brain changes when you experience loss and trauma Maybe something bad happened to you when you were five. Maybe something bad happened to you when you're 25. Um, but he talks about how it affects our brains and it's not our fault. If you're feeling depressed and having these dips in your mental health, like that's also, it's partly biological, it's partly social. And he explains that skating can be therapeutic, but it's not therapy. So skating's mm. good for us, but you need other things to rely on as well. And just being real conscious that firstly, what you're going through will uh, be normal to other people. Secondly, there's help to go through that, like resources and stuff and other people to understand. And and thirdly, just um, again, like when you understand yourself rather than judge yourself, it just makes life so much easier. So it's not stigmatizing you for feeling things or, you know, making a big drama out of something that everybody feels, which is, you know, things like depression and loneliness or, mm. you know, whatever it is. Like it's just a really cool bunch of skate groups that are addressing that and push to heal. Uh, uh, part of that, I think, as well. And if not, they've got some amazing things on, again, how skateboarding changes our neurological, uh, you know, reactions to things. And it's we can use the power of that. You know, we already know that skating makes us happy and gives us endorphins, but, like, literally understanding that better and, like, using it as a tool for our mental health is really cool. Yes. Is that the why so sad thing? Yeah, that yeah, yeah. That's his, John Ray, why so a, sad, that's support. his thing. Network is that? Yeah, he's got like a, a um, so he's got a website that has all the resources, but he's also got like a video he did with Nike SB, I think this or last year, explaining um, mental health and how skateboarding relates to that and can help yeah. us. Yeah, it's because his sister, um, yeah. passed away from mental health problems. Is it? That's right. Yeah. yeah. 
So speaking from a real position of, um, you know, understanding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's helped me dramatically with my mental health, especially in the few, last few years. Mm. I had some very challenging life experiences aside from the passing of my father. And I surf, but I wasn't getting what I needed in the surf compared to a skate park because it wasn't just it wasn't just about learning new tricks or skating and that physical exertion that was kind of healing mm. as well. It was the conversations in between and uh, the lack of judgment and just yeah. the, I think a lot of skaters I know, especially from the Wollongong area, just so empathetic. Like, and I really feel like empathy. <laughs> What are you laughing at? <laughs> I've got this chapter in my book called um, Radical Empathy and when I was filming Darren doing Radical, skate tricks Radical. before, yeah, I was um, it. He, he was reading it. Like I, I said, can you do like a skate trick on the rail with my book? And he, he did one and then he just opened it up at the book and read the title and he said, oh, and Radical Empathy. <laughs> so that's why I'm laughing. You should have screamed it out as you are sliding, <laughs> Radical Empathy. But yeah, empathy is true and Radical Empathy is something that we write about in the book um, and it's also two skateboarders. Uh, one who's a skateboarder who's blind wrote about this radical empathy that helps us skate together. So the, to cut the theory short, when we're at the skate park, we anticipate what the other skater is going to do without talking to them so that we don't crash into each other mm. and so that we all share that space. So I can literally see a dude turn up to the skate park, have nothing in common with him, wait a bit, understand his lines, and then I'll give him his turn and he'll give me mine. And I might have had the, you know, I might have had much of a go and he might notice, oh, you know, like she's holding back, like I'm going to pretend that I'm rummaging through my bag so she has a go because she's shy. Or I might think, you know, like that dude's had the worst day at work. He's got one hour of sunlight left. You know, I'm just going to skate another end of the park because he looks like he really needs that, I don't know, that ledge and that session. Or like we have a whole language where we don't even need to talk to each other, but we anticipate and know what skateboarders do. We can, you know, listen to us, each other coming. And so moving that from skating together to the social experience of putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes, that's radical empathy. And that's what the book really concentrates on, on how we're all going to get together. And you can get some some dude that's never met a gay person in their life, like totally just understanding that gay person is just like them in a whole bunch of ways and like, yeah, just getting on with them and respecting them. They're not being like them, not even like knowing about their lifestyle, but literally just having that respect and space together. Yeah. So you're currently employed as an academic at University of... I've got Griffith Uni Griffith. and I'm moving to Sydney Uni next yeah. year. Yeah, so do you want to talk about that, that move? <laughs> yeah, what, sure. What, what you're doing at Sydney University? Yeah, I'm real excited. Um, so I got a fellowship with Sydney University to do a project called Skate, Create, Educate and Regenerate. And what that those things bring together are what skateboarders are doing already. Like we're very creative, we skate together. Uh, but the education is also just, again, like... You know how you're saying with all these like issues, maybe if we had more education, like it's just trying to understand each other's stories and how we think and getting those stories shared so that we're not strangers to each other. Um, but the also the regenerate bit is thinking about our carbon footprints and how we go through so much wood and plastic and just wasteful stuff, right? Like how can we cycle our boards into something cool? Mm. How can we build skate parks or skatable spaces that are different from each other? So Sure, build big places like Mona Vale, but they don't want it to be football-sized skate parks. We can have like little tiny street spots like they have in Copenhagen, like they have in Malmo, like they have in Barcelona, that are part of the city that people have hours and hours of fun skating. Mm. You don't need a huge skate park. You literally sometimes just need two, three objects, the sculptures, to have a really great session with your friends to advance. It's uh, like a shared social. space. Yeah. They're doing that in Melbourne. There's a, yeah. yeah, in Melbourne. Yeah. Well, Newcastle's got a, a space that mm. wasn't built for skateboarding, but yeah. it's got it's the best sign I've seen in Australia. It's this yeah. sign that skateboarding <laughs> is allowed. Yeah. Just mm. be considerate of pedestrians. Yeah. You know, and it's it's great, you know, and then Barcelona embraces it like that yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. So the whole like regenerate is like, well, you know, do we need to keep building if things bigger and going through, you know, so much stuff and, you know, how do we just like – be a bit more mindful and appreciative of what we have. Like, remember, I'm from a country where, you know, after the war there wasn't much, you know, food. There wasn't, you know, like the place was bombed to obliteration. There were chemicals everywhere. Like, I really appreciate having food and clean air and clean water and having seeing trees that aren't, you know, affected by Agent Orange. Like, all these things, you know, like real it's important to, to me. It's hard to fathom. I'm, I'm not trying to be some hippie, you know, like judging people. I'm literally thinking about how... 
everything we do has consequences and an impact that can be good or bad and hard to be mm. kinder and, you know, have a sweeter impact on everything that we engage in. And skateboarding's like that too. So that's that's next year. And I'm also going to do a skate event for Mardi Gras, so like a queer-led skate event for skateboarders for Mardi Gras. So um, they're going to put a maybe a half pipe in Sydney Uni. We're going to get some roller skaters because that's an incredible scene that skateboarders oh, never anticipated. Noticed. But it's so rad. And so, um, yeah, and again, for, for people that feel marginalised and maybe they don't feel safe or cool just, you know, dressing up and going to the skate park and having a go, like this is the space for them. So just keep an eye out on all the socials for, um, you know, Mardi Gras for a skate event. And I'll be asking... Um, Particularly, I'm asking, you know, women and kids and girls and non-binary people just to come in and chat about skate designs that they would like to skate. Because, like, skate parks can be very generic. And if you ask a little girl, what would you like to skate? And she says, I want to skate a flower. Like, I get an opportunity to work with architects at the University of Sydney and designers to try and create a flower. So sick. And then I benefit from that. The little girls do. But so do you guys. Like, you get something literally more fun, different to skate, like, sure, you've never had to skate a flower, but, like, we love... We love flowers. We love, yeah, like, we love, you know, improvising. And I'm, I'm not going to get permission, but I, I want to put it in Martin Place, the flower. <laughs> yeah, well, I, here's a, I've got two things I want to tell you there. Yeah. Is like, um, so you think you'll write a, or do a research study that councils can use in... Building planning, skatable spaces, In their planning yeah. for, for more skate parks. Yeah. It's, no, not skate parks, skatable or skate, spaces. Skatable spaces, yeah. excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then we were talking on the phone, and I mean, there's even footage of Darren skating in the Plebs movie years ago at Martin Place. There yeah. was a sculpture there, yeah, yeah. And the bottom level, it was like uh, like triangular prisms stacked on top of each other, if I'm correct. And then the bottom level was kind of angled, and mm-hmm. it was a flat bank, and everyone used yeah. to skate it. And it was nef- definitely not designed for skating. No, not at all. You know, we've got to get a photo up for hey, to show yeah. Up. So that's the kind I, of vibe. I can, I can take that to architects to prove that it's been done before. Oh, that was an accident. That's what street yeah, skating. No, no, but like, previously. but like, no, I can take that and say yeah. it's, Martin Place has a history of skating, so you can't say it's impossible. It's already oh, been it's done. Got a long history of yeah, skating. Yeah, yeah. When, they, when they redesigned it, it's been. Uh, yeah. It's a yeah, yeah. It's a centerpiece of Sydney street skateboarding. It has been yeah, so much stuff. But like, there was the infamous Martin Place pit. Yep. It was like a little amphitheater that was just this yeah. purple, perfect like mini coliseum where it had ledges on the bottom level, mm. bottom step, and you know, everyone would sit around it. It was like this like um, proving ground, um, yeah, showcasing, yeah. and so much progression happened in that one tiny space that was never designed for skating. Yeah, yeah. So like, we we can now learn from that and say why not, as you say, Newcastle have spaces where it says skateboarding allowed, and you know we've seen in Tokyo there's like um is it the Heroin skateboards are part of that. There's some square in Japan, in Osaka, Osaka, Osaka Davis. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, like they've got a little square that they all skate and do these like really interesting tricks. Like is a, the Japanese skater that skates playgrounds and stuff's from there. Oh, um, he's really... Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like we, we think of skateboarding in, in such, you know, sort of traditional ways, but the Japanese, with what they had, sort of turned it around and made it very playful and fun and... You know, this is what I want for little girls to do. My target audience for my project really is like saying to little girls, what would be really fun to skate? You draw it and I'll talk to the designers and see what we can come up with. Oh, so cool. (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing. (laughs) It is, yeah. Let's tap into that creativity. Yeah, yeah, like real creative. Like none of this, like, you know, you've got to go to the Olympics and be a gold medal winner pressure. Like literally like playful fun. Like if you could design something really pretty looking and fun and like just do it and I'll see what the designers can do for us. Yeah. But I guess like it's taken years of skate park design for functionality to be, to work. It, mm. it hasn't come overnight. Like, I mean, we've, oh, Dan, and huge, I, huge Dan just, and I have skated a lot yeah. of badly designed skate huge parks. Huge respect because, for, yeah, the because they got, skate parks. they got sure. measurements wrong. They got, you know, spacing incorrect, or size of transition wrong. Like it can be, it can yeah. be stuffed up so easy. Well, so many skateboarders are, you know, building skate parks and they're architects now and mm. uh, East West Company have just built a skate park out at um, Ginger Apodi and the Northern Territory for spin effect skateboards. Okay. So they're like a First Nation skateboarding company. They're about two hours drive from Alice Springs. And it's, yeah, it's amazing. Like they've got a whole bunch of kids there that can and can't skate. But like for First Nations Indigenous skateboarders, it's really cool to see skateboarding 
skate parks being built by skaters in their communities. Right. So this is a DIY project, or is this no, no. This is like a really shiny grind project. Oh, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I saw it. Looks, that. looks yeah. rad. And yeah. Songline yeah. Skateboarding are going to go out and um, do a demo there. And um, is it uh, one of their skaters? He's um, we used to be on DC Shoes. Oh, Kieran Riley. Yeah, Kieran Riley is part of the Songline Skateboarding yeah. crew. Like his skating's rad, and just having like such role models to see skating. So yeah, um, I'm I'm all for like good architecture and good skate parks, but they shouldn't. They're literally not the only way to skate and they're not, it's not sustainable for us to build huge concrete skate parks everywhere. And it's Environmentally? Not, yeah, environmentally it's not sustainable to do it all the time. Like we need like options to mm. already use the concrete that exists. Like if you've got Martin Place and Upper uh, Brisbane, they've got King George Square, you've literally already got the space that the skaters exist in. Why not just push it back towards a more skater-friendly environment and allow like a, an obstacle to be there that they can skate? You know, it's going to happen anyway. If you can't beat them, join them as my... Because they're so petrified that a pedestrian is going to get... <laughs> oh, hey. And they don't, right? Oh, Australia it's skateboard. it's pretty rare. Sue us. Yeah. I know. That's that's the big thing. It comes down to risk assessment. Oh, what if someone gets hurt? Yeah, well, that, that can turn around too. Like, literally, there's so many... But, there's few, so few injuries from mm. that. And, I mean, I know I don't know a single skateboarder that's ever tried to sue... Yeah, that's right. ...for injury at, at a street spot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, skate, skaters can be a bit self-obsessed and we could or be a bit politer. I don't know, pedestrians that have tried to yeah, yeah. sue for that. We, we for can be more pedestrian aware as well. Like, you know, mm. like it goes both ways. And I think, you know, we as long as we're a bit aware, like not to yeah. go and charge and land on a pram if you're doing going yeah. downstairs. There, but what like, I've noticed in Newcastle at this yeah. spot uh, is like with the sign that says skateboarding friendly. So yeah. when pedestrians enter the space, like, and there's a lot of um, yeah. CBD office workers that will sit in the space and have lunch. Yeah. They're entering that space with a level of awareness, like, oh, this is a skate friendly area, so I'm just gonna, you know, I'm yeah. gonna be a bit more aware and Yeah, exactly. Maybe all maybe all we need is signs. Yeah, signs, bit of education, bit of ambassadoring. Ambassador. Yeah. Like um, bit ambassadors, yeah. Like seriously, skaters are the most charming group I've ever observed as a sociologist, or one of them anyway. And I've literally seen a lot of people totally charm like the most nasty security guards for one more try. And, you know, the public, like, you know, once they understand what you're doing and they, they get a concept of it, it's just kids having fun, they're pretty supportive of that. It's like, you know, like they don't want to see people sitting indoors all day not getting any exercise and just, you know, like they just like to see people having fun and it's explained to them that way. You know, you get more support that way. So more conversations, I guess, will be real helpful as well. Yeah. It's true. Or if you're rich, if you're a rich skater, you can bribe security guards. That happens. You know, <laughs> well, there's a lot of security guards are skaters now too, which is funny. Like and cops. I've seen I've seen footage oh, no. of police, like police. I'm, I'm not into that. <laughs> I've seen I've seen policemen yeah, like yeah. You know, I used to go to the skateboard and there's like clips of them like with their you know their holster. Uh, I, I'm their so not and... into that, but yeah, like I'm, I think they should put their guns on safety. That's for sure. Hell yeah! <laughs> Hell yeah! Yeah. Oof, it's, it's been epic, Indigo. I mean, I love that you've just uh, ex- context, put everything in a skate context. And it's <laughs> like, I don't know anyone that's done it as much as you and related everything back to skateboarding. But I had some other random questions, but I don't know if I'm going to ask them, but more around like <laughs> acad- academia and like sociology and stuff. But yeah, it's been cool. Yeah, it's been so nice. Uh, but, um, Look, I do ask all guests to come to the podcast with a cause they want to support or advocate for. and okay. But you've kind of like sort of highlighted a whole bunch of really good ones already right. that I can link in, in the episode show notes. Yeah. But is there anything yeah. pressing? I mean. Sure. There's this, there's a few shout outs I'd like to give. And one is to Spin Effect Skateboards. They're First Nations uh, skateboarding company started by Nikki Hayes. And they're just doing amazing stuff and um, probably – I'm just such a fan of the Songline skateboarding team as well. Like, you, you know, there's this saying, you can't be what you can't see. And having all these Indigenous skateboarders, uh, you know, repping their countries and their people and doing these amazing things for community is, is super, super cool. And, you know, if you think of um, maybe all the, you know, like great, great moments in sport that we were talking about before, like the Olympics with Muhammad Ali and... Um, you know, Kathy Freeman and all these athletes that are just so inspiring kid to kids to have those role models. So I think uh, all the power to people like Sunlangs who are part of that tradition. 
And then lastly, like you, you read it, um, you read this. I'm so used to talking to academics, your listeners, if they want to, they can go actually check out one of these projects I do called Consent is Rad, which is about, you know, when you're talking about, you know, maybe being better behaved and just treating each other with more respect and everyone feeling safer. It's like a no naming, no shaming, no blaming campaign, literally just looking at how, you know, we can just be, you know, more respectful and um, make everyone just feel safer and just skate together and have fun. So Consent is Rad, uh, Songline Skateboarding and Spin Effects are my shout outs or whatever. Amazing. And if you scroll down in this episode's show notes, uh, you'll find links to those and you can go Sweet. and check them out and, you know, uh, see how you can support. And also there'll be a link to some of Indigo's work. Amazing work. Um, Thanks and- for the conversation, Darren and Shan. Like yeah. it's been really cool just having a chat. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I don't know, is there anything else you want to end on? You think you've got it all <laughs> Oh, I just want everyone just to have fun together. And like when once we forget our differences and we all connect, like life's so beautiful, skateboarding, so power to us. Yeah. Power, power to the skateboarders. To... Yes, that's a great way to end. All right, we'll leave it there. Let's go. Thanks, Dags. No worries. Congratulations on the book too. Thank you. Mm-hmm.